and can they read the slides, I guess, is the question? Yeah, I mean, that works right there. Okay, because I would just love to be able to look at this computer. Yeah. So that I'm not, like, looking behind me the whole time, you know? Do you want to bring a table up there? Um, I don't know. Sorry. I mean, they can see you from there. Okay, that's fine then. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Just tell me you're ready and then I'll okay. start it. So this will click it on mine too. Okay, great. All right, I'm ready. Okay. Go. Hi, I'm Dr. Karina Jackman. I'm one of the um, chronic pain medicine physicians here, and I'm part of the Department of Anesthesiology Division of Pain Medicine, but we work very closely also with the Department of Neurology um, in their headache clinic, and then also seeing our own headache patients um, in the chronic pain clinic. So I'm going to talk tonight about myofascial pain and headache. And we will um, start by defining myofascial pain. So we'll talk about what does that big term mean. Um, and then I would like to discuss how it's related to tension type headaches, migraine headaches. Um, then we'll talk about the diagnosis of myofascial pain um, and how that relates to headache as well. And then what can we do for treatment? So myofascial pain syndrome is basically a musculoskeletal source of pain. And it's actually very common. There's kind of a debate about how prevalent it really is in, in our population, but it's very common. Um, it's a regional syndrome. It um, is related to active trigger points that are found in skeletal muscle. And you'll see this um, TRP abbreviation throughout the talk. So that stands for trigger point. Um, and a trigger point is a hyper irritable spot. So a very irritable spot within the skeletal muscle. Um, it's sometimes even palpable. So you could, some people call it like a knot in the muscle um, and occasionally is associated with a taut band. So this picture um, is exhibiting that. So this is a trigger point complex. This is muscle tissue. And then here's a nodule um, within it, which is where the trigger point is and a top band of muscle kind of around it. So this, this is, a, is a wider image here showing you these contraction knots throughout the muscle. And this is where the, the pain is emanating from, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so what it correlates to when your physician is looking for this, or your physical therapist, is tenderness when these spots are palpated. So if someone, if you yourself at home are touching these areas, or a physical therapist or physician is examining you and they push on one of these points, you can have very um, exquisite tenderness at that point or also pain radiating out from um, that affected area. And the pain will radiate kind of in the zone of where the muscle innervates, and we'll talk about that as well. So when someone has sources of myofascial pain within the muscle, we call it myofascial pain syndrome. Um, that's a diagnosis. Um, this is just a picture kind of showing you where a lot of different common trigger point areas or areas of myofascial pain can occur. Um, and then this is another kind of def definition of a trigger point. So they're painful on compression and then as we discussed, there's usually referred pain, referred tenderness, and also there can be motor dysfunction. So changes in the way you move um, related to that pain. There's two different types of trigger points. So there's active trigger points and latent trigger points. So active trigger points are areas in the muscle that produce constant pain. So for example, you could have um, pain here in your trapezius muscle in your neck, and that could be a constant, constant dull aching pain. Or you can have latent trigger points within the muscle, which only, cause, which only are causing pain when you're actually pushing on them. And these definitions are just important as we get into this discussion a little bit more. So, what causes myofascial pain? The, the etiology is really up to debate, so the cause of it is very up to debate. Um, there's certainly a lot of contributors to it. So uh, predisposing risk factors, um, body asymmetry, so just the way you stand, poor posture, um, mechanical, other mechanical stressors on muscles. So you can certainly have one cause sometimes is even an injury. So if you're in a car accident, for example, or an even a more minor injury, stress on the muscle, then um, if you're not actively using the muscle after that or stretching the muscle, you can develop um, these trigger points or myofascial pain within the muscle tissue. Um, it's also been related in the literature to nutritional inadequacies, endocrine dysfunction, um, and psychological factors. So stress and anger might play a role in predisposing you to myofascial pain as well. And then 
uh, there's been quite a bit of research done on um, what things cause resistance to treatment. So sleep dysfunction, smoking is a huge one, anxiety and depression. Um, so we know that because things cause you not or make myofascial pain worse and make you more resistant to treating the myofascial disease. Um, this might not just be a peripheral disorder of the muscle. So there could be a more central, um, central etiology going on as well for myofascial pain. So and now that we know what a trigger point is and we've kind of got a definition of myofascial pain in mind, uh, why are these little taut areas of muscle so painful? Because if you've ever had a trigger point or if you've ever had one treated, or if you find one on yourself just during this talk, if you have an area of tension, start, start pushing in that muscle and see if you can find a little area that when you push on it, it's exquisitely tender and the pain kind of blossoms out from there. Um, so why are these little areas in your muscle so tender? So we really have a lot of hypotheses about my myofascial pain and not a lot is necessarily um, written in stone, but we know that um, when there's sustained muscle contraction, so these little areas of muscle are always contracting, they're never loosening. So instead of sitting like normal muscle tissue would sit like this, they are sitting like this all the time, those little muscle fibers. So that causes hypoxia, which means lack of oxygen. So there's no oxygen getting into the shoe, and then also ischemia, which is um, low blood supply. So there's no blood supply getting to the muscle. And, we, and researchers have looked at the tissue surrounding these trigger points and have found that there's increase in inflammatory markers, which then can lead to a pain cascade um, causing, and there's increase in something called gene-related peptide and substance P, and both of these are pain-generating um, molecules. So we know that, that that is found in the tissue around these trigger points. So what is the link? Why are we talking about myofascial pain and headache school? And what is the link between myofascial pain and headache? And that's kind of a big question because the answer is we know a lot, but we don't know everything. So what we do know and what we're gonna talk about tonight is that we know that patients that have migraine and patients that have tension type headaches have a lot of trigger points. So we, we see a lot of myofascial type pain and trigger points in those patients. And what's less clear and less clarified and we're still looking at is how does that, what is the role in the pathophysiology? So um, how does that play a role in developing migraine or how does that play a role in, in healing migraine or preventing tension type headaches? And that, that is a little bit less clear, but we'll talk about tonight what we do know and um, what you can do about it. So these are some of the muscles that are implicated in headache. Um, and we're gonna break down migraine and tension type headache. But these are a few of the muscles that I would just like you to remember and we're gonna look at some pictures that will help. But the sternocleidomastoid, these are all in the head and neck. So that's the big kind of strap muscle in your neck um, that you can easily feel. Uh, scalenes are deeper in the neck. Trapezius, which is kind of back here. Um, your temporalis muscle. Um, superficial and deep master muscles, and then the semispinalis capitis and semispinalis cervicus are both kind of on the back of your neck, closer to the bottom of your occiput or the bottom of your skull. And then the suboccipital muscle is also right in the back, kind of at the base of your skull. So here's some pictures to help you understand this a little better. So this muscle, the X's represent the location, common locations of trigger points. So this is the sternocleidomastoid, both parts of the muscle. Um, this is the anterior portion. And all of these X's represent common areas for trigger point. And then the little red dots represent where the pain commonly radiates to. So if you have a trigger point here, it might radiate all the way up here to the top of your head or even around your eyes. So if you have a headache kind of circulating your frontal area here, it could be related to the sternocleidomastoid. And then the mo more posterior points here, also in that same muscle, can cause um, pain radiating here around the ear and then also pain across the forehead. So if you commonly have headache pain in either of these locations um, that's related to tension type headaches, you might, you might um, kind of explore your sternocleidomastoid muscle a little bit more. This is a very common area of myofascial tenderness. Uh, this is the trapezius muscle. So the trapezius is a, is a really large muscle and can cause pain radiating further down into your shoulders as well. But a common place for more head type pain is this area in the trapezius, so the upper trapezius area here, both of these areas where the X's is, and then the pain radiates kind of up in this distribution that you can see in the red. So really a very large area that can be affected by trapezius um, muscle tension. 
and then this, these are the two other uh, muscles I was referring to, and the back of the neck, so the semi-spinalis capitis, these two X's are the common locations radiating kind of across the forehead and into the temple area. And then here's the semispinalis cervicus, and it um, causes pain right here back in the, this is what we call the occipital area um, of, the, of the head. So if you've ever, if you, if you have a, uh, experience with occipital neuralgia, or you've heard that term um, when you've been diagnosed with headache, this, this could be commonly um, confused with that if you have um, trigger point eliciting pain there. Okay, and then finally, um, I think this is the last picture as far as muscles. This is the temporalis muscle, um, which is right here in your temple. And these are the various common sites of um, trigger points in the temporalis. And then, again, the red showing where the pain radiates to when you, when you push on these um, areas, if you have a trigger point there. Okay, so let's get to the big question, which is... Um, why do we care about myofascial pain and headache and what, what's important, what's not important. So we're gonna talk about migraine first and we're gonna discuss migraine and tension type headaches. So just a quick review, um, which most of you that struggle with migraine probably know this already, but um, the, the difference between a tension headache and a migraine. So the big things are that a migraine can kind of progress to moderate to severe pain. It's usually on one side of the head. It can be associated with an aura, so um, smelling something, um, even hearing something, seeing something before the headache, tasting something. It's usually a pounding or throbbing pain versus a dull tightness and attention headache. And attention headache is usually not debilitating. Um, both are kind of a steady headache. And then migraine specifically is usually associated with nausea and most people have sensitivity to light or sound. So those are the big difference. So we're talking about migraine first. So what, what do we know about migraine and, and myofascial pain? So migraine patients have a lot of myofascial trigger points. We know that, and that's been shown um, in multiple research studies. Uh, we know that in some patients, palpation, so pushing on those tender points can cause a migraine attack. Um, and then we know also that compared to healthy patients, like I was just saying, compared to a healthy control group, migraine patients are much more likely to have um, these tender muscle points, especially in the head and neck, obviously. And then really the most, the most common site of myofascial trigger points for um, migraine patients is still kind of up to debate, but these are, are listed in the literature as all the common locations, and these are basically all the muscles we just talked about. So pretty much anywhere in the shoulder, head, and shoulders, or head and neck, sorry. Um, okay, and this, this slide is a little bit difficult to understand, but I just wanted to point this out because some of you might be wondering, so am I saying that tension causes a migraine or that migraine causes a tension? And the, 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 basically we just don't know. So it's probably a little bit of both. So there's one um, thought, which is the bottom up model. So this is basically that um, possibly increased pain in your muscles or other parts of your body so increased myofascial pain maybe sensitizes your central nervous system and then increases your migraine burden. So that is saying that maybe myofascial pain makes migraine worse or maybe it has a role in actually causing migraine. So that's one side of the theory and um, some of the research in that has been done be based on the fact that some studies have shown that if you inject lidocaine or saline solutions into these trigger points, um, that are causing problems in migraine patients, some patients you can relieve migraine attacks. So that has been shown. So that's the bottom-up model. The top-down model is that there's changes in a patient that has migraines, there's already changes in the central nervous system. So there's changes in the brain and the spinal cord. And maybe these changes are actually what causes more tenderness in those muscles because of the central changes, which means in the brain and spinal cord, that have already occurred. So this means maybe migraine is actually affecting the muscles. And I would also argue that we know that even maybe the tension or position that you're sitting in, if you have a migraine um, and there's extra tension and stress in your body, even that could be adding to some of your myofascial pain burden. So, okay, this is just a little bit of the evidence. So this, this study um, showed that the number of active trigger points in the head, neck, and shoulder muscles um, of migraine patients were associated with just widespread sensitivity. So like 
pressure sensitivity or hypersensitivity in the whole body of some migraine patients, which some of us c would think about, you might think about that in, as, in terms of fibromyalgia, which is a different diagnosis, but they saw that some migraine patients just had kind of diffuse hypersensitivity, which was an interesting finding. And then these are two studies that um, looked at how myofascial trigger points can actually sometimes trigger a migraine attack. So um, this study showed that one third of patients in the migraine population that they studied, you could actually cause a migraine by pushing on some of these trigger points in the head and neck. And then this study down here, um, they looked again at actually provoking a migraine, so causing a migraine. And they showed that you could do that by pressing on specific points, but you couldn't do that by pressing on non-trigger points in the trapezius. And this was specifically in adolescents, so it doesn't apply as much to adults, but I thought that was really interesting. So they showed that if you were just touching all parts of the trapezius that weren't exactly implicated, that you wouldn't necessarily um, cause a migraine, but if you're touching those specific points, that you could. And the trapezius, again, is that kind of long muscle just right in the back of your shoulder. Okay, so moving on to tension type headache um, and myofascial pain. So again, ignore letter A, because this is specifically for infrequent episodic tension type headaches, but this is just a reminder of what tension type headaches are. So this is the most common type of headache. Um, it's a headache that lasts from 30 minutes to seven days long. Um, you have to have at least of two of these characteristics. So either um, a pressing or tightening or non-pulsating quality to the headache, mild or moderate intensity, um, so it doesn't prohibit you from doing things. Bilateral location, so both sides of your head, and it doesn't get worse just by routine physical activity. You don't have nausea or vomiting, and you don't have photo or phonophobia, um, both together. Uh, and it's not attributed to anything else. So your headache's not being caused by any other syndrome. So that's just the definition of tension type headache. This is a, a, just a picture of where the most common sites of pain are. So possible areas of pain and tension type headaches include all of this in the red, okay? So this is where most people, if they're having a tension type headache, feel that headache. Um, so we're gonna talk about, and then this is just a reminder of the comparison if you missed that slide. Um, so in patients that have tension type headaches, um, multiple, a lot of studies have shown there's an increase in muscle tension just in general or muscle stiffness in the neck and kind of around the cranium. And then um, that myofascial structures, so those um, that conclude in, this statement basically concludes that um, myofascial structures may be associated with the development of tension type headache, but probably are not the sole reason for tension type headache. So this is what we know just like what we reviewed what we know in migraine. So this is what we know about tension type headaches and muscular pain. So presence of these active trigger points in the muscle is significantly greater in patients with chronic tension headaches compared to patients that do not have tension type headaches. So that's the first thing. And then also the tenderness in the tissues around the head and neck is correlated with how intense and how frequent people get tension type headaches. So that's, that's pretty um, interesting. And then referred pain that you get from actually pushing on active trigger points can also ref actually reproduce the, the distribution of the common headache for these patients. So that means basically most patients that have tension type headaches, if they have an active tr trigger point, and you are applying pressure to that point, you can kind of recreate where their normal headache pain is. And then again, we talked about what an active trigger point is versus latent. So one that's a latent trigger point, again, is just one that um, causes problems when you push on it. So um, both types correlate with greater headache intensity and longer headache duration, or sorry, active trigger points are more likely to correlate with um, greater headache burden, so more headache, intensity and then longer headache duration. So a lot of correlations here between this muscular pain and tension type headache. So we've also, we've discussed um, both of those things. Okay, this is just a specific um, study by Cardis and multiple other authors. They looked at treatment for these trigger points in patients with tension type headache. And we're gonna talk about treatments in just a second, but 
they did multiple sets of lidocaine injections into the trigopharynx in 108 patients that had frequent episodic tension type headaches. Um, and they, this was a double blind placebo controlled randomized controlled study, say that 10 times fast, but basically this means this was a good study because they had a control group and a non-control group and one group didn't know what they were getting. So they were getting a placebo or sorry, both groups did not know what they were getting and one was getting a placebo. So that's kind of the definition of the, the best type of clinical trial. And they saw that there was reduction in both the frequency and intensity of pain with the headaches compared to the placebo when they use lidocaine to inject into the muscles. So that's a pretty clear correlation with treatment of the myofascial pain and being able to decrease the headache. And then an, a separate study, separate from this one, also found a reduction in the frequency of pain and pain intensity um, when they used um, an actual analgesic, which means a, a, a local anesthetic such as lidocaine. And then they also saw a decrease in anxiety and depression in those patients, which is interesting. Okay, so now we have, know, know how this relates to both types of headaches. So let's talk about how do you know if you have myofascial pain syndrome and then what can you do about it? Because that's really what's the most important thing, right? Um, so diagnosis is a little frustrating because it really relies on um, a practitioner that is experienced in diagnosing myofascial pain. So that means a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant that is really used to, di to diagnosing this, or a physical therapist is sometimes the best person to look at this as well. Specifically a physical therapist that is well versed in myofascial pain. So um, just as, as a reminder of our kind of coordinating clinics, so um, the pain management center that's here in Research Park near just kind of almost next door down the street from the neurology clinics. Um, we have several physical therapists that are very focused on myofascial pain and that's their specialty, as well as all of our physicians in that practice are, are well versed in diagnosing this. And we treat this very commonly for not just headache, but really a lot, we see a lot of myofascial pain and low back pain. It's a very common cause of low back pain, um, as well as hip and leg pain and really any type of pain. Um, we see this you know, all day, every day. So it's very common. Um, so it relies on someone actually doing a physical exam. On physical exam, the, the exam points that are most related to, um, to a positive finding of this is a tender spot in the affected muscle, which we've talked about, actual referral of pain to the zone where the muscle should be referring pain to. So kind of those diagrams that you saw, the red areas, so if pushing on that trigger point causes pain in that expected area, then that is likely really myofascial pain. Sorry about that. And then if pushing on that tender point reproduces the patient's usual pain. So when you push on it, if it causes tenderness or referred pain, but that's not their usual pain, then that you're, if you're unlikely diagnosing the cause of their pain. Does that make sense? And then these things can also sometimes point you towards this diagnosis, but aren't necessarily as reliable. So just local tenderness without the pain expanding from that area, or just palpating a top band of muscle. So just because you have a tight muscle doesn't mean you have myofascial pain syndrome. So that, that's not always a finding. And then um, a twitch in the muscle. So sometimes if you push deep enough into a muscle that's, that's really taut, you'll feel a twitch in the muscle. And um, you don't always feel that in myofascial pain. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the correct diagnosis. This is, so there's been some experiments with ultrasound to see if maybe ultrasound is the right way to diagnose myofascial pain, but unfortunately it's not very um, specific for this, but this is just an example. I don't know how well the image is showing up, but this is the, that upper trapezius muscle in the back of the shoulder and neck again. And this area that's more black is the trigger point. So. You can see one here, one here, one here, all in this along this band of, of muscle. But it's, it's pretty difficult to discern, and I think, and it, unless the practitioner is really well versed in um, ultrasound, I think it's, it's a fairly difficult way to diagnose this. So this is, this is exciting. Um, this is called uh, ultrasound elastography, and several clinical studies have looked at using this method to diagnose um, trigger points. So this is just an example of um, looking at a muscle and this color is kind of all the same. And so this is, this muscle all has the same amount of stiffness versus down here, 
there's this one area. So over here, again, it looks like kind of a black circle. And then over here, you have this area where there's decreased color. And that indicates a stiffer region within the muscle. So there's ongoing studies looking at validating this as a way of diagnosing myofascial pain, um, which may or may not have a lot of implications in the future. So what are we doing right now to diagnose myofascial pain? Um, I think the main point I want to emphasize is it's, or sorry, treating. We just talked about diagnosis, but for treating myofascial pain, the main point is it's really a multidisciplinary approach to this. So likely you need a physical therapist involved to help you, uh, possibly a physician, and then a big part of this is, is you as the patient. So um, physical therapists offer a lot. They offer a way to diagnose this, to find where the areas of your trigger points are, but then they can also do manual release where they are kind of pushing on the trigger points to release that area of muscle, um, massage to that specific muscle. And then the biggest thing is that they can educate patients on how to do self-release, which we'll look at a few pictures of that, but they can show you how to release that muscle at home. So for example, if you have trigger points along your sternocleidomastoid in your neck, which is harder to release by yourself. They could maybe show you some different stretches or different massage tactics that you could use at home. Um, and, and, and the big thing to understand from this is that if you see a physical therapist and they're helping you release some of this muscular tension, the most important thing is that you know how to go home and keep it relaxed once you're at home. Because the muscle, once it's trained to kind of lock back in that pattern, will tend to go back into that same um, same taut uh, trigger point after it's been released. So it's important to learn how to really keep a gentle stretch um, home program going so that you can keep that relaxed. And then the last thing they do is called dry needling, which I have a picture of here. So physical therapists um, can place these little tiny needles, which are about the same size as acupuncture needles. They kind of are acupuncture needles. So they can place them in the muscle along into exactly where these trigger points are. And then they attach these electrodes, which send kind of pulsations of energy through the needles. And it just kind of almost just taps into the muscle. <clears throat> into that area of, of taut muscle and helps it relax. And usually it takes several of these treatments, um, but maybe more and more time in between treatments. And then while after a treatment, between treatments, you're at home doing stretches to kind of help enable that muscle to stay, to stay relaxed. So this, this works extremely well for some people and it's a, it's a very quick, easy treatment to do um, in the clinic. So what is the physician's role? So as, a phys as physicians, we're definitely obviously diagnosing myofascial pain. We're helping to co do kind of care coordination with physical therapists um, and with you and with your home program and any medications that might help. So anti-inflammatory medications, Tylenol, things like that are the most likely to help with myofascial pain. Um, we can certainly offer advice about lifestyle factors that might help like quitting smoking, for example, um, better sleep because poor sleep and poor sleep hygiene is definitely related to not being able to recover from myofascial pain. But so we help with all those things. And then we can also do trigger point injections into the muscle. So it's very, it's similar to dry needling, but a little bit different. So this is a picture. So we find an area um, where a trigger point is, and then we inject just a very small amount, like one milliliter or one cc of of bupivacaine or lidocaine, a, a numbing medicine, into that area. The actual medicine is only provides numbing um, for a very brief point part of time, but that pressure of the medication actually causes that area in the muscle to relax, and then and then the the actual fluid of the medication can provide a little bit of pain relief while it's relaxing, because these can actually be exquisitely tender when they're injected, but. So we can do this very quickly in clinic, and usually it requires multiple treatments. So our kind of typical standard um, thing that we start with in the pain medicine center is doing a series of three times, like maybe once a week or once every two weeks of trigger point injections. And then we kind of reevaluate, like is this helping you, et cetera. But then this is combined still with home exercises. So I have this down here, but the patient can help by doing home stretching, home massage, and the manual release of these points. So these are a couple of pictures of the patient's role. So here's an example of a way that we sometimes uh, recommend releasing trapezius uh, trigger points. So the kind of up here further in the neck behind the shoulders, but these are just 
little tiny balls that you can actually roll along your spine that can help release those. This is using a tennis ball along the sternocleidomastoid or scalene muscles, uh, again, to help stretch out that muscle, help release some of those triggers in the muscle. And then this is this really interesting um, cane. It's called a Theracane or a Back Buddy. You can buy it on Amazon. It's like $30 or somewhere else, I'm sure. But um, that's probably the easiest place to buy it. And it has all these little knots on each end. And it's a great way to do a manual release of, of um, your trigger points at home or have your partner help you do it at home. Um, and you can actually, it's easier to get to those points on the back of your neck or the back of your skull base with, with these canes. So a physical therapist can easily teach you how to use this or a physician, um, or you could probably watch a YouTube video as well um, because there's a lot out there, but really it just means that you apply pressure onto that tender point until you feel it relax. So you're going to push pressure, it's going to be exquisitely tender, and then the muscle relaxes. Um, so this is a great method to use at home. Uh, there have been multiple studies done on Botox. So Botox is, um, some of you might be familiar with using it for your migraine headaches. That's very different than injecting it into a actual trigger point. The Botox formula we use is all in very specific points. And it might have a little bit to do with actual muscular pain, but um, this, is, this is a different topic. So this is just injecting Botox into those muscular trigger points. Um, and Botox just relaxes basically the area that it's in. So all, the combination of all these studies basically showed that there's really not a lot of efficacy. So insurance companies usually don't approve it because Botox is ex very expensive and there's not really good evidence for it. So I've seen it um, help a few different patients, but it's really not something we commonly do anymore. Okay, so that was my last slide about treatment. Um.